Hi, this is Carol, and you're listening to Analyze Asia, a podcast dedicated to dissecting the pulse of business, technology, and media in Asia. This week, our conversation in the world of mobility continues as we invite a special guest onto the show, Mr. Pradeep Parameshwaran, the president of Mobility Asia Pacific at Uber. Welcome to Analyze Asia, Pradeep. It's your first time, right? It's my first time. Thank you, Carol. I'm so pleased to be on here with you to talk mobility and all things about technology and mobility. I'm very excited as well. And I'm not sure if you heard our last episode, but we actually mentioned Uber quite a few times because we were talking about Grab and it's $40 billion swag. And of course, you know, we had to mention Uber and here you are. <laughs> I know. Perfect timing. I've got to say we are watching that deal with great interest. As you know, it was a very tough decision when we exited the Southeast Asia business, but it was a $700 million investment. Seems like we have done quite well, uh, and we are very excited for Grab uh, to go through this process and see how this plays out. Yeah, and I will get you to share a little bit more of your thoughts on that topic later. So before we start talking about Uber in Asia Pacific, I'm sure our audience will also love to learn more about you and your career. You know, I know that before coming to Uber as the head of Central Operations India, you were also, you know, once the CEO of Den, India's leading cable TV distributor, and previously a partner at McKinsey. But how did your career, how did it all get started? My career started in the late 90s. My first job, Carol, interestingly, was selling ice creams at Unilever. And uh, I, I say that because I'm such a believer in the bits and atoms model, which is I love the fact that there is atoms to our business and it's on the ground and people are touching and feeling our service. So I started sales two years and then I made a switch to consulting. I spent over the last 20 years, 10 of which was in the US and the last 10 in India doing consulting work with a large number of technology companies, a lot of Asia-based companies who are trying to grow global, working in software, in telecom, in high tech. And I've been seeing this technology revolution from close up for many, many years. So when Uber came along now four and a half years back, uh, it was fascinating because I had a chance to really apply a lot of, I'd say, consultants, theoretical knowledge to back to the real world and build with a company that just, in my opinion, is truly changing an important part of the world and hopefully will be a solution to some of the biggest challenges that the world is facing with climate change as well as with cities becoming you know more and more difficult to live because of traffic and congestion. So that was four years back. Through my time at Uber, I've run the India business. Over the last year, I've had the fortune of working with colleagues uh, around Asia-Pac in a variety of markets, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Australia, New Zealand, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. These are all such amazing countries with great heritage, great aspirations, and mobility can play a big role in how each of these countries evolve in the next few years. So that's kind of been my last 20 years or so. I know this is going to be tough because, you know, you've led such an illustrious career, but if you had one lesson that you'd like to share, you know, over the past 20 years uh, with our audience, what would that one lesson be? I think it will be related to technology. I've got to say technology has completely changed the way I thought about business. And my encouragement to everybody is make that part of your basic learning toolkit. The way we think about English and languages or we think about math and we think about basic subjects. I think technology has to be a basic thing for everybody right from school. And I'm very proud to see Asia really kind of take a leapfrog here, right? We have probably, I'd say, amongst all big continents are the biggest adopters of technology. You're right now in a country which is at the forefront of deployment of new methods of doing everything. It's changing education, it's changing healthcare. And so I've been blown away by just the possibilities that technology has. So my encouragement is really invest in learning, going deep, understanding the nuts and bolts, and really thinking about how this can change the consumer experience if applied in the right way. I keep telling my colleagues uh, around the world, which is watch for Asia because Asia is going to leapfrog the world in so many ways. We didn't have personal computers here. We went straight to mobile is a great example of recent technology. But similarly, I think we don't have a lot of physical assets built out, for example, in education or in uh, in healthcare. But I think technology will help us leapfrog that as well. So very excited by the possibilities there. I'm definitely with you there, agreeing with you know all your all your points on technology and on Asia. So let's now talk about Uber in APAC. To start, can you briefly talk about Uber and also your role and coverage in Uber for Asia Pacific? 
Indeed. We are a bit of a microcosm of the world. So on one end of the spectrum, I have countries like Australia, which are developed markets. They could very well be like the UK or the US. And so a lot of the things that happen there are similar to what happens in other parts of the developed world, which is high car ownership, public transit in many cases not as evolved. And uh, a lot of the challenge there for Uber is how do we provide an alternative for people who use private vehicles for transport? So that's one under the spectrum. On the other side of the spectrum, we have countries like Japan, Korea, Hong Kong, Taiwan, incredible public transport, right? They have in many ways invested in building systems that don't need people to own cars. And so our job there actually is not to replace public transport. In fact, our job is to be strong complements to public transport and figure out ways of how Uber can work with public transport to help consumers just move around a lot more seamlessly. And then we have countries like India and South Asia, which is at the front end of the spectrum of evolution from an economic standpoint, where public transit is not fully built equally the uh, development of the country doesn't have a lot of private vehicles. So this is a great chance for us to leapfrog private car ownership, right? Where people don't have it. But if we really work closely with governments to build out shared infrastructure in the right way, I think we have an opportunity to not have the cycle of people owning lots of cars, right? So the math in India, the last I've seen it, there are less than 20 cars for every thousand people. China is 120, the US is 700. And, you know, with the pollution and the traffic that we have, and I live in the world's most polluted city in Delhi, can you imagine if India has five or 10 times the number of vehicles it has today? That's not a city I want to live in. So I'm hoping that we will be making a difference to to leapfrog private vehicle ownership. That's awesome. And what are, you know, some of the current um, businesses from Uber operating in, in Asia Pacific? There's, you know, Uber Transport, Uber Eats. Yeah, so we have three big lines of businesses. I, I lead the mobility business. We have the delivery business, which has been one of the incredible stories through the COVID period. As you imagine, people are not stepping out and ordering more. And the Uber Eats business has expanded dramatically, not just in other parts of the world, but right now in Asia Pack. Asia is home to, I think, four of our top 10 high priority markets of the world. And that's a you know clear indication of how good the product is and how needed the service is. We also have a third vertical, which is much smaller today, but is anchoring what we call all delivery outside of food, which is things like groceries, alcohol deliveries, things like that, which is still in its very, very early stages. So those are services. But even inside transport, Carol, I think it's worth talking a little bit about what we do inside mobility, if you give me a, a few minutes, because if you'd looked at the US, we would be mostly what people know as the Uber X service, which is point to point car service. But in Asia, we are doing so much more than what we are doing in other parts of the world. For example, we have a large two-wheeler, three-wheeler franchise that we are building because people move around differently. So Southeast Asia is a classic example. Grab and Gojek are world leaders in two-wheel ride share. And frankly, we are learning from what's happened in markets like Indonesia to build out that service uh, in markets like India, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. We are also working on things like Uber Rent, which is you take a car. I mean, if you think about, if you've traveled to the US and the airports, as a consultant, I did that for, you know, 12 years. I got to say, the process of going and renting a car with an Avis or a Hertz is actually quite painful, right? It's a very poor experience, which hasn't changed for a long period of time. And we are launching services that allow complete streamlining. If you want to take a car for two days, you have a weekend trip, you don't own a car, you have that ability. So it's a self-driven option. It's not the current Uber, which is, you know, a driver coming and picking up. That's an example. We are working on transit, which is our partnerships with uh, with local transit companies, where we are able to provide first and last mile transport to the transport station. So that becomes a bit more of a complementary service. So there is a variety of innovation on mobility that we are very excited about in Asia Pack, and then at some point, I'm sure we'll talk about electric. Uh, and I think I think there's just so much to be done in in that space. Definitely. I'll definitely get to that. So you mentioned a little bit about, you know, COVID-19 or just the impact. So what are some of the ch current challenges for Uber operating in countries such as, for example, Japan, Korea, India, and Taiwan due to COVID-19? What a tough situation. I don't think, you know, any of us have seen, have seen anything like this in our lifetimes. And I, 
I hope we don't have to see this <laughs> see this again. It's been tough on so many counts. Right now we're just going through the second wave in India, but we have had multiple waves of COVID in other countries the last many months. It's been hard. So, you know, our first priority really has been safety. If you go back to middle of last year, right, virtually as the first wave hit us, we were amongst the first set of companies to go out there and say, we are a transport company, but we went out and said, don't travel. Don't get out if you don't really need to. And make sure that you are staying safe. And at home, we will have a chance to kind of work with our consumers again when they came back. So safety was of the highest priority in markets like India. We have uh, invested in things like plastic sheetings, separation between drivers and riders. You see that now in many countries that was not common a year back. We did that for 80,000 plus vehicles uh, in markets like India. We have driver vaccination support that we have announced. You know, we have working to physically kind of support their vaccination. We are funding their vaccination. If they are doing it through third parties, we expect to have more than 150,000 drivers vaccinated over the course of the next few weeks and months. We are working on support measures that we have taken for our driver partners when earnings have been down and that's been done in, in many parts of the world. You know, frankly, all of this is just around that fundamental theme that You just have to make sure that people are safe. I've got to say equally, the scaling of the Uber Eats business has helped people stay inside. In markets like Taiwan and Japan, where that business has become so much larger, I think that's contributed to keeping people uh, people safe. Order of magnitude, we are investing two and a half million dollars in a market like India on vaccinations. And then the other interesting thing, which I'm particularly proud about, Carol, is we are providing free transport support for people who are trying to go and get to vaccination centers. As you know, there is some vaccine hesitancy in many markets, right? And Japan is a classic example, right? We have just announced 20,000 free rides uh, for elder folks to be able to get to a vaccination center. We are likely to do that in, in, in some other countries as well. And our belief fundamentally is that, which is if vaccination happens fast, I think we can hopefully get back to the world as, as we used to know it pre-COVID, right? And so we are doing everything in our power to use our core care competency, which is transportation, to help with that. So a variety of things, mostly all centered around this theme of safety for our uh, riders, drivers, and our communities. What I'll end with and say is that what we know is when the cities recover, Uber recovers really fast. So Australia is a classic example. Our business is back to pre-COVID levels. And that's happened mainly because the people are moving around. They feel safe. The cases are down. They're able to get back to office. They're able to get back to kind of socializing. And all of that, as that happens, our ride sharing will come back. So we are very confident that that, that will happen over time. Wow, that um, uh, vaccination initiative uh, with the free rides, I think, I think that's awesome. You know, really doing your part to help the world recover. I love that. So I know that, you know, Asia Pacific, other than China, uh, you know, when you sold your steak to Didi in China and then Southeast Asia, that was to grab. Um, other than these two places or regions, um, Uber is currently operating in the rest uh, of Asia Pacific. So where are you seeing the most amount of growth and where are you seeing the most amount of challenges in terms of country or region? You know, my experience with Uber over the last four years is growth and challenges go together. For us, there is no growth without challenges, right? (laughs) It's because because that's what comes with being a disruptor and being an innovator because we are trying to do things that have never been done. And when that happens, everybody's trying to figure out how to make this. So I'll give you a few examples of the opportunities. Let's start with Korea, which is five years back was a no e-hail market. E-hail doesn't exist. And then companies like Kakao, Uber, TMAP, which is owned by SK Telecom, uh, a few others started that movement. And I'd say that market has gone from 0% e-hail to more than 25% e-hail. All taxis, right? It's not private vehicles as we know it in many other parts of the world. Because there's real value in e-hail, right? Why would you stand in the street and, you know, take, if you're in peak time, aren't you much better off just, you know, pressing a button, booking a car and that comes and picks you up? Right? You don't have to be out on the street kind of, you know, trying to flag fare down. So that's the speed at which e-hail has grown. We have just re-entered the market through our joint venture with SK Telecom. It's called UT. The U comes from Uber. The T comes from TMAP, which is the SK entity. UT together fascinatingly means our taxi in the local language. And Korea is going to be one of our most exciting growth markets uh, because we are 100% 
taxi driven, which means that we are partners to the local taxi ecosystem to improve their earnings. Right? That's one, one example of growth. The other example of growth, which I think is fascinating, is Japan, right? $15 billion taxi market historically has very little e-hail. It's less than 5% e-hail to my, the best of my knowledge. On the back of regulatory change that allows ride hailing to actually really take advantage of our technology, we hope that becomes one of the bigger growth markets for the next few years. As one example, in the details of why e-hail is so important there, Japanese drivers actually drive more than most other countries for lower earnings than their existing options if they were not to be doing driving and doing other jobs. Because fundamentally, the pricing regulations are such that we cannot drive higher efficiency and lower price, right? And this, by the way, has been now solved in all parts of the world, right? The regulations are such that if you are in peak time, the pricing is a little bit higher. That allows drivers to make more money. If it's off peak, it's actually cheaper than taxi fares. Again, that you know spurs demand and allows drivers to make more money. And so that technology change along with the regulatory change, I think in Japan will become a big growth opportunity. The last one I'll, I'll spend a minute on is, uh, is Hong Kong, where we are right now in the midst of building out a taxi business. You know, for people who lived in Hong Kong, Hong Kong taxis are iconic, right? Uh, the red color taxis, which you are familiar with. They're also green and uh, green and blues and other colors. We think actually there is a great value if we are able to bring Hong Kong taxi onto the Uber platform, right? Because again, it helps book, get reliable uh, transportation at the convenience uh, without standing out on the street, right? We think that's a great opportunity. Our taxi business has doubled just in the last four months. And we see great amount of adoption and love from Hong Kong riders for that service. So multiple opportunities, North Asia, as you, as you can see, figures prominently in our growth plans of the future. Of course, you know, our existing large franchises in Australia, New Zealand, and India, South Asia will also continue to be big opportunities for us. Definitely sounds very exciting. When you mentioned the rental as part of the mobility, yeah, I'm also using a DD2 rent bikes and cars. And I see that they've also came out with financial services, oh, an entire line of different uh, opportunities, definitely. Is Uber still meeting certain difficulties in terms of you know having to cope with different regulatory requirements from the different regulators in the region? Or is that something that uh, is uh, kind of been dealt with and uh, it's in the past now? Yeah, great question, Carol. It's a topic I think that's close to the hearts of most of the leaders at Uber. Many years back, I think when Dara stood, just took over our business, one of the things that he did say very clearly was he wanted to change how we did business and particularly stressing on partnerships with governments, with cities, with stakeholders there. I'd say our reputation, you know, in the early days, uh, at a time when, frankly, there was no precedent, uh, was one that, you know, we entered the market, you know, and, you know, with whatever the product and service was, and it took us time to kind of work with local regulators. And that's changed a lot in the last few years, particularly under Dara's leadership, which means that we are now at the table with local regulators in every country that we operate in, working through what's the situation today, what should be the situation of the future, how can technologies like Uber help transportation improve in a city, because we firmly believe that's the interest of the governments, right? They're very keen to provide a better experience to their citizens. We are at the table thinking about how can we reduce pollution through adoption of electric. I, I can share a couple of examples here recently that talk to that. We're also working with a large number of governments around the idea of improving number of jobs, right? So in countries like India and South Asia, job creation is a huge challenge for the government. And Uber's created hundreds of thousands of economic opportunities for independent workers. And we believe that we can play a big role there. So both in terms of improving mobility and for riders, but also working with governments around improving number of jobs, as well as the quality of the gig work uh, environment is something that we are working through in every single country. To your question, is it an issue of the past? I'd say we have dealt with a large number of the big topics, but many of the topics that we are dealing with are new, right? And it's right, it's happening now as we speak. And so we anticipate that over the next, you know, few years, these topics will continue to evolve. And my sense is there will be newer ways of doing work 
And we hope to be part of that solution working with local regulators. Definitely. And I'll ask uh, about your thoughts uh, about the future as well. But before then, are there any new businesses from the or business lines from the US that might expand into Asia Pacific? For example, like Uber Freight? Yeah, Freight's a good one. One of the things that you'll see over the last few years is that we have gotten very focused on what we choose to do in-house versus what we are trying to do with partners. So, for example, our bike business, which is which used to be done in-house, we have a deal now in place with Lime. We have an equity stake in them and we are building them, uh, building the Lime business out as a third-party aggregator, right? So we are supporting that outside. We have a partnership with Aurora on self-driving vehicles. I'm sure we'll talk about that. It's a fascinating topic. But again, we are building that in partnership with uh, outside players. Uh, so that's an example there. The three lines of businesses that we are building, very much committed to building in-house, are mobility, delivery, and of course, freight. And you asked specifically about freight. My sense is I... Don't think freight's going to be in the immediate term future of Asia Pac, and primarily because it's at its very early stages, right? We have pilot markets in uh, in America as well as in Europe. There are a lot of things that we have to learn about that business, and we want to be making sure that we learn it, scale it the right way, and when it's ready, we will bring it to to Asia Pac. So freight, maybe not as much, but. On the other pieces, like I said, we imagine Uber should be the transport platform for everything about go and get. And you'll hear this more and more in the way we talk about our vision of the future, which is we want Uber to be the platform that you use to go anywhere. And we want Uber to be the platform which you use to get anything. And this anything is the opportunity that we are now pursuing really aggressively in all parts of the world. So acquisition of the alcohol delivery company called Drizzly in the U.S. is a, is a good example. Our acquisition of Corner Shop, which was a LATAM-based company, which is basically providing the core tech that is used for grocery deliveries. That's already rolling out in many parts in Asia as we speak. Some big announcements are forthcoming in the next few weeks and months on that. So I'm very excited about that. And like I spent some time before, we are really thinking about mobility in ways that are very different reservations, right? You always think about Uber as an on-demand product. I want to go somewhere, I press a button, I get an Uber in five minutes. What if you want to book something ahead of time? You want the early morning 4 a.m. trip to the airport and you want the, the certainty. We are working on kind of rolling the reservations product out. We are working on Uber Pass, which I'm very excited about. It, you buy a monthly pass that gives you amazing terms on your delivery and your mobility. For example, the one that we have just launched in Australia has free delivery of food and 10% off on all trips that you take on mobility. I think that's an exciting product. And so there are a number of things that are, and anyway, you can see at the speed at which I'm speaking, Carol, that I'm very excited about the, the number of innovations that are coming around core growth, drivers and delivery and mobility in Asia Pack. Yes, I can see that you're definitely very excited talking about these opportunities and you're very excited to talk about self-driving cars as well. But before that, just wanted to get your thoughts on what we mentioned earlier, which is the recent grab $40 million SPAC with Altimeter. What are your thoughts? I am blown away, but to be honest, it is such a new way of going to market that we have never seen in the past. What we can say is that as relatively large investors in Grab, it has been fantastic to see what Anthony and team have built. It's a franchise that is deeply loved in all parts of Southeast Asia. They have been at the forefront of innovation. The idea of the mobility super app is something that Grab's done better than so many other players. So there's a lot we have learned from them from an innovation standpoint. Uh, but equally, I think we are very excited as, as investors. Um, as I briefly alluded to this when we started, um, I was here when we made the decision to exit Southeast Asia. And I know that is an incredibly difficult decision for us to make. But in hindsight, a $700 million investment that will return multiples over three years is a, is a rare investment. You don't come across these kinds of opportunities. So we are very excited to see Grab do so well. I think we are all very much in wait and watch mode to see how this plays out. But we're very optimistic really for both the SPAC route, but also for grabs long-term future they are so well positioned to succeed in southeast asia yeah definitely looking forward to uh, more miracles and stories that they're going to create so now on to the advancement of self-driving cars where do you think um uber's role with you know autonomous vehicles uh, is going to be in the, in the future 
Carol, autonomous is clearly very much the future, very much a technology that will make a big difference to the way we move about. I think there is enough proof points to say that this will become mainstream. It'll probably be a lot longer than people think because this is extraordinarily complex uh, to build. As you know, there are a few companies that have been doing work on this over the last many years. And I think it's clear from the various signals we take from these players that it's going to be a little bit more in the future than than right now. Why is it important? Simple things, right? I'll give you the stats in India. More than 5 lakh people die on the roads every year. And a lot of that is because humans are prone to errors while driving. Much of the way technology is envisaged is to make sure that actually is something that can be eliminated. Now, are we there there now? We're probably not, but this technology will evolve to be able to deliver that. The other reason is simple, shared infrastructure, right? 80% of all trips that happen in peak times in a market like Australia happens with one person in a vehicle. And you can imagine with the kind of carbon footprint that's generated by these trips. I think we would all be happy sharing vehicles with others if it would be convenient and uh, affordable, right? And I think self-driving potentially can deliver that and hence has a massive impact once you pair that self-driving and electric together it makes such a massive difference to the carbon footprint of transport so i think this is going to happen the commercialization of this we have just in fact only talked about tech right the commercialization of this is a whole different issue one of the things that we believe very strongly is once we have a network uh, and uber is the largest ride sharing network in the world that's in place it should be very possible for self-driving cars to plug into that network, right? And we don't go from 0% self-driving to 100% self-driving, right? Self-driving will start taking a little bit of share, some use cases, some trips, whereas the others will be driver-driven or driver-assisted, and it will evolve over a long period of time. But I think this is something that we choose to participate through our partnership with Aurora. Uh, We strongly believe in the technology that they were building and Joining forces with them gives us access to the tech and we have building the commercial network. We hope that that tech can ride on in the coming years. Do you think that China and the U.S. will end up leapfrogging ahead um, of the rest of the world in terms of adaptation to self-driving cars? It's a great question. So self-driving has is going to manifest itself not just in cars, but also in bikes, in three-wheelers, in electric micromobility. I actually think that there's a very strong possibility that Europe plays a big role in in its adoption of bikes, as an example, right? It's it's already the home to some of the biggest bike players and bikes are, by definition, going all electric, right? And self-driving and electric together there, I think that's, you know, I think it's very possible. To be honest, it's too early to tell, right? China and the US have been historically the drivers of innovation, right? And and if you think about drivers of innovation along with capital, it's a very, very strong combination to drive commercial adoption. But I think it's very, very early days, frankly, to be able to, to assertively say that. And you mentioned electric vehicles. So what are some, you know, Uber's policies or initiatives when it comes to EVs? That one is more here uh, and now. That's right. That I think that that's a great example of uh, technology that's evolved over the last many, many years, but is starting to come to a place where it can scale. Our belief on the way the world of transport will be is it's going to be shared, it's going to be electric, and it'll be multimodal, right? These are the three words we use to describe our vision of transport in the future. Because we are an important region from a consumption standpoint, right? I, I just recently looked at the stat. If you look at the total consumer consumption for the next 10 years, there is a total of $10 trillion of consumption in Asia PAC in the world. Half of that will come from Asia PAC. Half, right? And relative to the size of the business uh, we are today, Asia PAC is a much smaller part of our global business currently. But if half of consumer growth and consumption will come from here, this notion of shared electric and multimodal will become critical in the future. So we are, we are seizing the moment both globally and here. Just at the, head, at the headline level, Carol, you probably are familiar We announced that by 2040, we expect to be 100% zero tailpipe emission vehicles, which is battery EVs on uh, our micromobility and public transport. By by that time, we expect everything everywhere in the world. Now, the timing is different for different markets. So, for example, we think that's going to happen in the UK by 2025, in most European cities by 2030, 
and by 2040 in other parts of the world. And I'd say Asia is a little bit behind in some parts of this, right? Let's take uh, Asia Pac uh, broadly. So let's take Australia as an example. In the UK today, 11 out of every 100 vehicles that are purchased are electric. In Australia, it's less than one. There's a long way to go, right, just to catch up in a market like Australia. But we are playing our part. For example, we have just announced that as opposed to our traditional service fees, which are north of 20%, all electric vehicles, we have announced a much lower service fee commitment for a year. And our belief is that when it's combined with government ride-sharing subsidy, which was what the US did at scale, and I understand China's done at scale, that combined with our incentives can at least make it worthwhile for a commercial taxi driver or a commercial rideshare driver to buy an electric vehicle and make it a lot better economically for them. That's important, right? They will not only do it out of the goodness of their hearts, right? It has to make sense from an economic standpoint. And so that's one example. Similarly, in a market like India, we actually don't think cars are going to be at the forefront of electrification. It's going to be two wheelers and three wheelers. And you see the technology evolution and manufacturing that's happening in India. We think India is going to leapfrog the the globe when it comes to these two products. And we already have 5,500 vehicles that are electric on our platform today. And our commitment is to get that number to multiples of that in the coming year. And for India... You know, the country needs it, right? 14 out of the 20 most polluted cities in the world are here. And so if you want to make a dent, you have to be able to make sure that we are able to expand electric vehicle penetration uh, in these two markets. So these are two examples of two of my largest markets in uh, in Asia Pac. The other example that I want to give you, Carol, is going back to our original discussion about the role of public transport, right? If the Uber technology is paired with public transport, public transport's biggest challenge is they can serve all the trunk routes well, which is dense areas to dense areas. It's fantastic. But the moment you go outside the dense area, the economics of public transport start to collapse. Right? You cannot run empty buses into small communities. Over time, it becomes really expensive. That's where Uber comes in. Right? So if you apply the technology the right way, you can. we can transport people from less dense places to kind of points of aggregation. They can then take a train or a bus from there. And then at the back end of it, if you need to get someplace, we can provide last mile transport for that. And that is right now happening in Sydney. We have a pilot there that we launched uh, a few months back. And we expect that will happen in other markets as well. So again, you think about the combination of shared, electric and multimodal, right? Two-wheeler trips, three-wheeler trips, bus trips, all of that comes together to be able to make a real dent on this situation that we are facing with congestion and with the footprint that we're leaving with all the transport miles all of us are are adding up to the global consumption. Last question, and I know you've already kind of answered it a little bit, which is how do you think the transportation business will change in the next few years? I know you just said the future is shared, it's electric, it's multimodal. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Yeah. Indeed. I have two kids, Carol. I have a boy and a girl, 12 and 9. Both of them are raised in Delhi. Both have been asthmatic because of the air we breathe. And it's primarily because there are just too many vehicles on the road carrying too few people. For one, just a little bit of a quick sidetrack. I love what we have had to learn about working from home. I think we've all discovered that we don't need to be on the road all the time. Right? We can find hybrid ways of working, which are equally impactful for productivity as it is, frankly, for the environment. Just quick sidetrack. I'll come back to the core question. Let's take Australia. And I, I, I want to tell a story about the possibilities. Right? It's one of the most amazing businesses that we have around the world because consumers have adopted ride sharing like no other country right on a per capita basis the number of people who use ride sharing in australia is higher than any other part of the world in the last 10 years 2010 to 2020 the number of cars in australia have increased by 85 percent in that same time the number of kilometers driven by a car has dropped by 35%, which means people are buying, but they're just not driving. Partly because we are all from a generation, frankly, where we haven't shown that there's an alternative to owning a car. The reality is they're not driving because they are using the Ubers of the world. They're using public transportation where there's an option. But because we don't give them an option for everything, 
What if I want to do a grocery trip? I need something urgently to go to the pharmacy. What if I need to do a weekend trip away? What happens when I don't have a car for these things? We have, as ride sharing, have not fully solved for it. But the moment we give people an option to say, if you want a car on your own, rent one for a couple of days. If you have a grocery trip, there is a neighbor's car that's available. You can pick that up on our technology platform, take it for two hours. Or there can be an UberX trip that takes you to to your dinner at night and if so you don't have to drink and drive. Once you put together a solution that is all of it, and when I say all of it, it means that it's a shared vehicle. It's it is definitely a, you know, a multimodal solution where you can travel any mode of transport and it's absolutely electric where the footprint per kilometer comes down dramatically. Australia would be a great market where we could absolutely slow down the march of car ownership, which I think is very much the phenomenon of the last 50 to 60 years. But I strongly believe that the solution of the future is very much about getting people options so you don't feel like you need to own a car. That is a future that I also see. And it's what I think that's where I live in right now. I don't think I, I need to to live uh, to own a car. And I, I think more and more young people are seeing that as well. Yeah. Thank you. No, these are, I love these stories. I love it. I, I'm sure our listeners do too when they hear, you know, stories that uh, you like to share. So last uh, two questions. Um, first is, do you have anything that you'd like to recommend that has inspired you recently as you have been working from home? You know, a book, a podcast, a show, even an article. Yeah. So my latest, I'd say, curiosity, a uh, topic of curiosity is crypto. So I'm just learning and uh, listening and, you know, trying to figure out what this is all about. So I won't talk about that. I got to talk about a book that I read uh, a few weeks back called The Range by Daniel Epstein. I've been so impressed. So there's a little bit of backstory to this in that in a world where everybody's chasing specialization, right? You're just trying to become deeper and deeper and narrower and narrower and narrower. And I'm not a specialist, right? I'm fundamentally a generalist at heart. And I love to solve problems. And I love to build, bring various things together to figure out how to solve something. So I've always been a little bit thinking about for myself, you know, frankly, in the way we are raising our kids, you know, to what extent should they be thinking about specialization versus kind of being generalist. And David Epstein's book does a, the best job I've seen about laying the case out for why it's actually okay. And it's good to be a generalist. And how do you really think about the skills that come from collaboration, the skills that come from a fundamental multidisciplinary thinking, which is how do I bring commercial, tech, economics, marketing, policy, all these things together. And in my job, I, I, that's one of the things that I'm learning to do better and better, which is solutions are can come from anywhere. Innovation comes from anywhere, comes from any team, any function. As a generalist, how do you really find an environment where all of these things can come together to drive some of the most uh, disruptive solutions. And Uber is obviously a platform that allows me to do that. I actually also um, bought this book and it's on on its way, but I haven't uh, read it yet, but I've heard such great things about it. So I'm also looking forward to reading Range um, after your recommendation. Last but not least, how can or where can our audience find you if you know they like to uh, reach out to, to you or to you know Uber? Asia Pacific mobility. So the best way to find me is on LinkedIn. That's where I'm most active. In fact, we also on have a number of country blogs that are available. Uh, it's super easy to Google our country blogs in, in, in all of our major countries. Most of our big announcements are there. Uh, our research papers are published there. Uh, I find it very rich um, uh, for consumers or people who have a general interest in what's happening at Uber. So those are the places you all can go find us. Do these blogs also share great stories? I hope so. I hope so. I think we, we, we take a lens of being able to really paint the picture of what the future looks like. And, and that's part of the excitement of being, a, being at a place like Uber. So I, I hope you all will find interesting stories in, in, in all of these blogs. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for doing that for us today, you know, painting um, the vision of future for us. Uh, so thank you so much, Pradeep, for coming on to Analyze Asia. And um, all of our audience and listeners, you can also find all of Analyze Asia's episodes on all available podcasting platforms. And we'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode and all on all previous episodes and last but not least stay safe everybody and i will see you next time thank you again pradeep and i'll see you next time as well
拜拜。